from the south. Weekday. Only on Telesur. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. Russian President Vladimir Putin has met with the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Ji in Sochi. They discuss regional and international issues ahead of the Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to Russia scheduled for June. This year, the two states will celebrate 70 years of bilateral relations. Russia also welcomed the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to Sochi for his first official visit to the country. The top U.S. diplomat arrived in the southern city having canceled his planned trip to, Ru to Moscow. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said his meeting with Pompeo was productive. I want to say once again, the discussion was frank, intensive and substantial. I hope that the visit of Mike Pompeo will not only contribute to the improvement of the atmosphere of Russia-US relations, but will also allow us to take small but real steps in resolving practical issues which need to be resolved. The issues of bilateral agenda and also of the regional and world agenda. Speaking after his meeting with the U.S. Secretary of State, Lavrov condemned unilateral sanctions placed on Iran by the Trump administration. He said he plans to discuss the crisis created by the United States' actions in the region with Pompeo on Wednesday. What was announced in Tehran about the situation concerning the sale of oil from the Islamic Republic of Iran reflects the incapacity of our European partners who have taken it upon themselves to develop a mechanism which makes it possible to circumvent non-legitimate American sanctions on Iranian oil exports. Tomorrow, here, we will try to clarify with the U.S. Secretary of State how the Americans plan to get out of this crisis, which was created by their unilateral decisions. I am counting on a frank conversation with my colleague tomorrow. Also on the agenda was the Venezuela, with Russia saying that U.S. threats against the Bolivarian Republic had nothing in common with democracy. Lavrov confirmed Russia's commitment to the sovereign will of the people once again are calling for dialogue between President Maduro and the opposition. As far as the international agenda is concerned, we discussed many issues openly, including the situation in Venezuela. Russia believes that it's the people of the country who should define their future. It's important that all patriotic and politically responsible powers of the country begin a dialogue, and a number of countries in the region actually call for it. Now, to have more information about these meetings, we have the following report and send us at our correspondent in Moscow, Hansel Oro. Welcome, Hansel. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov have met in the Russian city of Sochi. They have discussed the situation in three countries, Venezuela, Iran, and Syria. Regarding Syria, the discussions and negotiations were related to U.S. President Donald Trump's statements about withdrawing troops from the country. On Venezuela, Russia defended its call to create a group of countries within the United Nations to protect Venezuela against a possible military intervention and against attacks to its sovereignty. Russia also defended its support for dialogue between the parties in Venezuela to solve the situation through politics instead of force. Regarding the situation in Iran, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo delayed a meeting in Russia so he could be present at a European Union meeting about Iran. 
His goal was to gain support for his country's actions against Iran. However, the EU does not support U.S. aggressions against the country, and in line with the EU position, the Spanish defense minister has pulled a military frigate from the combat group in the Persian Gulf. Pompeo was also in the meeting with EU representatives about the incident in Saudi Arabia, in which several oil tankers were sabotaged. Russia continues to push for dialogue to keep the Middle East stable, at a time when the United States is increasing tensions in the region, putting at risk international security. The talks between the U.S. and Russia are also influenced by the New START Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. The treaty expires in 2021, but Russia proposed to extend it for another five years. But the U.S. has not given an answer. Also, both countries have confirmed their meeting during the G20 forum in Japan in June. The presence of both presidents, Trump and Putin, is confirmed. Thank you, Hansel. Now we go to Venezuela, where the foreign minister has condemned the actions of Portuguese bank Novo Bank, which has frozen over 1.5 billion euros of Venezuela's fund at the request of the U.S. government. On Twitter, the foreign minister said, the illegal holding of these funds affect the entire population of Venezuela, as they are destined for importing medication, food, industrial equipment, supplies to treat malaria, HIV, and other chronic diseases, as well as to pay standing financial commitments with international bodies and to pay to the salaries of foreign service personnel. Arreaza added that while his Portuguese counterpart announced that banks do not answer to the Portuguese government, it's clear that they do, not, they do answer to the request of the United States government. This comments came as the Bolivarian government has continuously requested that the Portuguese government step in to put a stop to the illegal freezing of Venezuelan assets. In Argentina, a secondary building of the lower house of Congress has been evacuated due to a new bomb threat. This comes 24 hours after a similar threat forced the evacuation of Congress on Monday. Reportedly, no explosive devices have been found. And thousands of students in Brazil have gathered in assemblies to prepare for Wednesday education mobilization. Close to 5,000 students from the Federal University of Goya's state attended an event in which they gave a symbolic hug to the university building. An even bigger demonstration is planned for this Wednesday when students will protest against costs to the public education. And Mexican authorities have, have rescued 142 migrants who were abandoned in a truck in the state of Veracruz. According to officials, there were mainly Guatemalan families with young children. The driver reportedly fled, fled from the truck, which belonged to a courier company. The migrants received medical treatment before being handed over to my immigration authorities. Time for a first break here in from the South. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Lesser English and on my account, of course, at, tele, at Laura Pra, at Laura P. Telesur. Stay with us. Sudan's military leaders have come to an agreement with protest leaders to have three-year transition period to transfer power to full civilian administration. 
Council Member General Yasserb al Ata said a final agreement on power sharing will be signed within 24 hours with the Opposition Salate Alliance. Salavar. It will include the forming of a new sovereign council which will rule the country until elections. He said during the transitional period the parliament will be composed of 300 members of which 67% will be from the Opposition Alliance with the rest from other political groups. We have agreed on a transitional period that will be three years, where the first six months will be dedicated to the priority of singing off peace agreements and stopping the war in all our beloved homeland. We promise our great people that the agreement will be totally completed and achieving the aspiration of our people in less than 24 hours. And there has been a ceasefire in the Countess Yemeni port of Hodeida. Hodeida is Yemen's main port and a lifeline for millions of Yemenis on the brink of starvation. However, war has restricted imports of foods and supplies. At a new conf at the news conference, Lieutenant General Michael Lollesgaard said that Yemen's internationally recognized government and Houthi rebels can verify that the withdrawal of opposing troops has taken place if implemented this agreement opens the door for broader peace actions. But since we will not have no gap between phase one and phase two, we cannot start phase one until we have finalized phase two. But once it starts, it is envisaged that it will take a month and then the full redeployment will be implemented. Thousands of residents have fled their village in northeast Nigeria, Borno State, fearing renewed attacks from by Boko Haram after a recent raid. Last week, a raid the rebel group killed six people and burned dozens of houses. Residents of Molai village have taken shelter in displaced camps in the city, with other lodging or recent renting around the city. The village has been attacked four times in the last two years. We are going to find anything, even a tent, to live our life there because we have nothing, no food to eat and no shelter. Even our mobile phones, they destroyed everything. Burkina Faso President Rock Christian Cabaret has condemned a state of attacks on Catholics that killed 10 people in two days. Gunmen killed four Catholics in a religious procession in north of the country. A day after a priest and five parishioners were murdered at mass, the attackers set fire to the church, several shops and a small cafe before looting a health center. Burkina Faso has suffered from deadly attacks attributed to a number of jihadist groups that target Christians, clerics and Muslims. Burkina Faso must remain upright and we will fight them until violent extremism and intolerance are no longer present in our country. Burkina Faso has always been known as a tolerant country from all perspectives and we must work to maintain this richness that, I would argue, our ancestors passed on to us. Hundreds of demonstrators have marched in Guinea-Bissau's capital to demand the appointment of a new prime minister and government. This comes six months before the proposed date for the presidential elections. The country's National Electoral Commission has called for the presidential elections to take place in November 3rd. This political impasse comes two months after March legislative elections took place. The school year is getting messed up. That's why we are in the streets. The president is not this country's only son. We have gone through 11 years of a struggle. We want to say to the president of the republic that he is questioning the expression of the people at the polls. But let the president know that as soon as the people have expressed their choice, they no longer have any questions to write about freedom or about who should govern or not. Obviously, it is the people who must govern. Time for a second break here from the South. Stay tuned.
And a commission from the International Monetary Fund arrived to Ecuador on Monday to ensure the country is adhering to the conditions imposed in exchange for a $4.2 billion loan. This visit is part of quarterly evaluations planned by the IMF in order to approve the loan which was requested by Lenin Moreno's government. In March, Ecuador received the first payment, which is conditioned on measures like reducing government spending and a tax reform, among other neoliberal austerity measures. And teachers have taken to the streets in Peru against the firing of their colleagues after they joined a strike last year. The group protested in front of the Constitutional Court in Lima and they claim facing criminalization of the right to strike after thousands of teachers were fired on or sanctioned for joining general strike in 2018. And we stay in Peru. Protesters from 14 regions of the country held a national strike on Monday against the government's neoliberal policies. They say these measures have left more than 2 million campesinos poor and abandoned. Why? Well, we show you on the following story. They left the cultivation fields to march through the streets of the capital, Lima, to demand that the government, led by President Martin Vizcarra, address their concerns. There are thousands of small agriculture producers that are condemned to poverty as a result of climate change, the lack of technical assistance, irrigation infrastructure, and economic resources. There is poverty due to the neoliberal policies that have been implemented for more than 20 years. The agribusiness is completely abandoned. There are many times we do not even earn the cost of production. We are in debt with the bank and the government does nothing. We want them to hear our plight and assist us farmers in our work, sacrifice and continued fight. Farmers who comply with the government's measures point out that despite supplying 80% of food to Peruvians, they face unfair competition with imported goods. These products come from countries that subsidize agriculture and enter tax-free due to more than 20 free trade agreements subscribed by Peru. Peru is becoming an import-dependent country and we small and medium-scale farmers will not allow it. And that's why we have come to the streets to fight for our rights. Roughly two million farmers say they work in precarious conditions. Meanwhile, the government owns irrigation infrastructures which are being used by large transnational agribusinesses. They do not even pay for the hydroelectric power plant. The land was aware to them and they were given cheap corn, etc. And taxes were also dismissed. They do not pay the IGB. The state loses over $5 million a year. That is totally unfair and that is also corruption. The small-scale farmers say if a solution is not presented to them, they will proceed to undertake an indefinite national strike. And CARICOM's Secretary General has called for a unified and urgent response from member states on the situation in Venezuela. Ambassador Ibrahim Larac was addressing the 22nd meeting of the Council for Foreign and Community Relations taking place in Granada. He said the political situation in Venezuela is worrying and requires an urgent and concerted response from all actors. Larac said CARICOM must be guided by the principle of non-intervention. He called on member states to bolster relations with like-minded nations and continue to advocate for multilateralism. Meanwhile, in the opening of the two-day meeting in, on Monday, Larocque also called on the U.S. to lift the unguaranteed economic sanctions against Cuba. Next month, the 50-member group will host the sixth meeting of Ministers of Foreign Affairs of CARICOM and Cuba. Like this, we come to the end of this report, but you can find this and many other resources on our website, terrestrialenglish.net, where, of course, you can read opinion article and find our special interviews. And before we go, we'll leave you with the following video, because this 2019 
marks the 500 years since the passing of one of the world's truly great geniuses, Leonardo da Vinci. The anniversary is being marked in many ways until Azur joins this celebration. Until next emission, thank you for watching.